All right, Don, uh, today can you tell us a little bit about the uh, aerodynamics within the world of NASCAR? Oh yeah, I'd be really glad to do that because, um, you know, I was always a proponent of, you know, streamlining the aerodynamics back in the early 90s. Of course, up to this point, I think it's got totally out of control, but that's just my personal opinion. It's a, it's, it's a, uh, it's a phenomenon because, you know, when they started racing stock cars originally, no one even thought about uh, aerodynamics. One driver who will, name, will remain actually anonymous at this point said early on that they found out about it accidentally. And Bobby Allison backed this up for me. You know, they had a trouble, had some trouble with the car overheating back in the in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, and so they took a little piece of aluminum and put it below the radiator, and it was a it was a ang piece of angle aluminum, and it was about two by two, you know, in in width. And they put it under there, and they said, yeah, it helped the, the overheating, but it also made the front of the car stick better in the corners. So I thought, well, maybe it isn't that. So they took it off and and they found out, oh yeah, it made a difference. So they put it back on and tested it again, and then they put a bigger one on. And as the weeks went on, they kept sneaking bigger and bigger ones on, and finally NASCAR said, what are those guys doing? And uh, they found out that that caused the car to have a lot more front downforce, so it would turn a lot better, especially on the super speedways when the, when the speed was way up. So it continually evolved, you know, and in the 90s, we, it was all about the front air dams and the, le and the length of the deck lids and, and how that would increase the downforce and make the car stick to the track better at, and the higher the speeds were, the more critical it became. And um, so, you know, we used to fight about, you know, who had, the longest deck lid. Why don't you know? Why don't all the cars have the same deck lid, and all that kind of stuff? And at, the, at this particular point, I'm going to tell you about if we had a Pontiac. In fact, you'll see the one I'm talking about in this uh, in this museum, uh, Rusty's uh, car, the uh, Miller Genuine Draft car, and. We were saying that if we had a deck lid as long as the Oldsmobiles, we could be a lot more competitive. Well, you know, NASCAR wasn't going to listen to us. We were we were winning races, you know. So, but it, but that was a fact. You know, we wanted a deck lid. So I was in the trailer, the red trailer, with um, Mr. France one day, arguing about whether we should have a deck lid as long as as the Oldsmobile so we could have more rear downforce. And finally, uh, and finally he said, Miller, you just need to get out of here because you're making me mad. Okay, I'll, I'll leave, sir. You know, there's a guy, but just a, an offset here. Uh, that's a guy I learned to have more respect for now that he's gone. I should have been more tolerant, but anyway, he threw me out of the trailer and I was all dejected and I was walking down the steps and there was a guy at the, at the bottom of the stairs and it was Chris Economaki. I don't know if you ever remember him, but I know some of the people out there in, uh, in the uh, old NASCAR land, they remember Chris Economaki. He was a famous motorsports um, personality and reporter. And he said, hey, Don, come here a minute. I want to talk to you. So I, I, knew, I had known him for a long time. And he said, I want to tell you a little story. Because you're getting yourself, you're talking yourself right into a corner with these people at NASCAR. I said, well, I, you know, I'm not afraid of that. He said, I know you're not. But he said, that's what's going to make it even worse. He said, the one thing you need to do is shut up for a while and listen. OK, I'm going to shut up. So Chris proceeded to tell me the story. And you know, Chris is famous for the, uh, the old statement of, do you know what time it is, Chris? And then he tells you how to make a watch, you know? <laughs> but anyway, uh, he told me, he said, you know, back in the 40s, 
He said, midget auto racing was the greatest uh, piece of motorsports that there was. He said, we raced six nights a week. And he said, you know, everybody was always complaining that they didn't have this or they didn't have that. And the other guy had it and they didn't have it. And he said, so eventually the rules makers made the cars more and more and more alike. And he said, then they found out they were so much alike, nobody could pass anybody. So if you got out in front, you just, you, you know, you couldn't, you could get away from everybody and that was it. The race was over. And he said, pretty soon we were only racing three nights a week because nobody went to, to the races because they knew what was going to happen. And I see some of that happening right now. I see the fact that the cars are so aerodynamically uh, deficient, not, not to the point that the cars are not slick. It's just that if somebody, if somebody has a good car and they get out, once get out, they get out in front, it's pretty hard to get around them. You know, you could pass when you're in, in traffic when there's a big clump of cars, but when you're out front, you're just about gone. So I think one of the things that they need to do is if, to make this new car even more popular. It's popular with the fans because a lot of different drivers are winning and I think that's good for the sport. I think that it's time to take a look at that and make those cars so they are not so uh, aerodynamically uh, affected by you know, their, person, their regular design. Their design needs to be modified so that it hasn't got that kind of a, uh, a stressful, uh, you know, demeanor. That's, and that's only my personal opinion. So there you have it.